I'm lazy, so I like sitting down. So if you build a chair, you got a place to sit. We're here at the Windsor Chair Shop, where we're gonna learn about how to make a chair. You know, chairs are interesting. Sometimes they denote power, as in the chair of a board. Sometimes it denotes um, missing someone, as in Broadway singing about empty chairs. Chairs are an important part of our life where we might relax our back or even sit down to think. Come on in and let's check it out on your long way home. Chairs, why chairs? You know, I guess the easiest of that is I was, oh, probably, you know, I've done woodworking my whole life. I always liked doing it, but about 15 years ago, I was looking to do a present for my wife for Christmas. And I found a picture of a chair in a magazine. Uh, it was a rocking chair. And so I thought I can build that chair. So I gave it a shot and started working on it. I think I started about July and I finished that next May, it took me a long time, but I found it very rewarding, difficult, but rewarding. So really when you're building a chair like this, you have to change how you think. It's not like building a wall, you have to think in a, a three-dimensional way. Right? You do, yes. So yeah, when you're you know, constructing a house, framing a house, everything's pretty square. And that's your whole goal is to have it square. You don't want it out of square. It takes away from the strength and stuff. When you start building chairs and stuff, uh, you have to look at both. You gotta look at strength and the fact that nothing's square. And so you gotta figure out ways to make it strong, but yet uh, also not be square. So there's, and there's tricks to that. How do you keep the strength? Well, if you know, when with the new power tools we have, you just cut right through anything. It'll cut through and the tool doesn't know. But the way you keep strength is you want to uh, follow the grain. Follow that grain the tree was growing in. And that's where the tree has its strength. And so rather than cutting through it, if you can split the wood, then you're going to get the straightest board you can find. It's going to be straight up and down. For example, the oak tree is always known as the mighty oak, the, the strong oak tree. Um, the oak happens to be the ones that they like to build the top part of Windsor chairs with because the oak tree will bend really easily. It can be manipulated that, but it'll keep its strength after you bend it. Those fibers will just bend, you know, with a little bit of heat and then just bend them around there and let, allow it to dry. It'll take the shape you want it to, but it'll be just as strong as it was when it was straight. And in some cases, it'll be stronger. So you're here at the Windsor Chair Shop. Yes. How did you come to be a student? I met Chad because he came and helped me with my band, so I just set it up. And we got talking, and I looked at his website, and this Maloof rocking chair was just, it was just awesome. And once I saw it, well, I thought, I've got to make one of those. Can you show us how you might split some wood? I can, yeah, I can show you real quick. Um, I've got uh, some pieces here that have already been somewhat split, but we'll, we'll even take them further. So um, this, this is a piece of red oak, and this is still quite green. Even though I got it about a year ago, what I do with it is when I get it, I put it in a freezer and then it stays green. I just have to pull it out. So last night I knew you were coming, so I pulled it out. So this is still really green. I actually order these from Back East. Back East has a lot better trees than we do here. You can find trees here that are good and straight, but a lot of our trees kind of grow crooked because of the winds and they're not, a, they're not competing a lot. So whereas Back East, they're competing in the forces, so they go really straight, really tall. Just to give you an example, this chair here, this is a chair that was designed by a gentleman in Tennessee. His name is Curtis Buchanan. 
He calls this his democratic chair. The reason the term democratic is not political. It means for the people. And so this chair he designed to be able to be built with very few tools. You don't have to have a lathe to turn the legs. They're all done with a draw knife and a spoke shave. You can carve the seat with all hand tools. Using this chair as an example, what we're gonna do, we gotta be able to make these spindles right here. And you can see how they're quite thin right here, but they've still gotta be strong. Right, so, so, so just if you think about that, my brain says that can't be that strong, but just based upon what, what, what we just said, splitting it maintains that strength correct. and it really is strong. Yeah. This one, you can see the grain on that. That is very straight grain. When I split it, it'll fall that then when I work it what will happen is and after I get it in here it's still a little green it'll actually straighten itself out because it doesn't have it anywhere else to go it's something holding it here something holding it down here it'll eventually make the shape of what I want it to so it's doesn't you know if you got crazy grains that doesn't work but for just slight uh, curved grains that'll work um, and so we do want to follow the grain so to do that we're going to use what they call a fro, they call that a shingle fro. There's different types of these. You want one that has kind of a narrow part here because if it's too thick, it's hard to split it here. Originally, when, when this log was first split, to get it in like it halves and quarters, you need to use like an ax and some wedges. But once you get it to these smaller sizes, it's quite easy. And then you just need a club. Any kind of club like that one. This one's getting a little beat up. Notice a crack in the handle but that's made out of a piece of dogwood. You've seen the dogwood by the rivers uh -huh. here, how yeah. little they are. Well, in Tennessee, that's how big they grow. So <laughs> <laughs> that's where I got it from. But what we'll do, and whenever you split a piece of wood, you're gonna split it. You know, people say where to split it. Well, split it right in half. So we're gonna make four spindles out of this. Four of those spindles. So we're gonna take it. And just pick an imaginary line there. Yeah, and you can see it's splitting pretty good. We're going a little heavy on this side. Um, if I had something to wedge it, I could actually get that thing to move a little bit if I could wedge it underneath it, but I don't have anything. So sometimes you, if by wedging under it, I can put the, put the pressure to the heavy side uh -huh. and it'll change that crack just a little. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Huh. But I don't have that, so we're gonna just start at this side, see if we get it to, finish that split so we don't get a little tiny end here. And now you see how that compensated right yeah. in the middle there. You see that it just yeah. left just a little bit. Okay, so now again, every time you split something, you're gonna split it in half. That's just the rule of thumb. Split it in half. It yeah. Split it in half. Yeah. Well, that one got got away from me a little bit, so that might work. May not. When we trim that down, we might be able to get a spindle, but we may not. But we'll definitely be able to get one out of that one. Right. You can look at these, and they they sell online for about four thousand uh, dollars on up. And I always wondered why. And as I thought about it, you know, if you were to buy a, a couch or something like that, you know you're going to replace that in five years. This chair is an heirloom. And the reason you buy or it costs that much is something you're going to hand down for generations. So this is a solid chair. And this is a shaving horse. Yeah. This is... They have shaving horses, and they have a shaving pony. And a shaving pony is similar to this. Uh, the shaving pony sits on your workbench and uh, is just portable. Whereas this is a lot less portable. So let me find the seat for that. And I'm a little bit spoiled. I like to have a padded seat. So. <laughs> And we're gonna grab a draw knife here. So this is what they call a draw knife. There's all different kinds of these. Um, you'll notice it's, it's got a bevel. 
you know, it's either going to be beveling that way, and usually has a straight here. Sometimes they'll have bevels on both sides. Um, some of these tools are used with the bevel facing up. Some of them are used with the bevel facing down. And the way you can tell is how the blade, the handles line up with the blade. If they line up with the blade straight like this, that's a bevel down tool. So I would use that with the bevel part facing down into the work. Oh, I see. Yeah, if the, which is counterintuitive to what I would have thought. Exactly. Yeah. So let me find you one that's a bevel. Hey, there's one that is a bevel up tool. So you can see the handles are not lining up with the blade. They're down just slightly. I see. So this one's designed so that you use the flat part of the tool, not the bevel part facing down. I see. You can see the advantage to this for getting nice straight lines. You got a nice big surface area here and that'll cut a nice straight line. Whereas this one, when I'm cutting, I've only got this much I'm riding on. It's a little tougher to, on a real flat straight line. But if I want to do a little curve, this one will curve a lot I more. See. So my so, dad used to say, you always want to take a knife and use it away from you, but you're doing exactly doing opposite, the opposite here. Opposite. Right. Here. And is that control? <laughs> it's control. You just have better control, yeah. right? And you will not cut yourself. It just can't. I mean, these are designed to not be able to cut you. Right, right. But there are some wider than that you could, but you'll never get your hands in here. Sure. You also have a whole lot more power pulling, pulling than you back pushing. Pulling versus pushing forward. Which that is one, sense, of, yeah. one of the advantages, you know, the, the Chinese and the Japanese, I think they must be smarter than us Western people because all of their tools work on the pull stroke, not the push stroke. So their saws, if you buy a Japanese saw, which is like this, that'll work on the pull stroke, not the push stroke. Whereas a Western saw works on the push stroke. Ah, and you get more power on that pull stroke. You also will notice if when you start using these, you have a little more ability when you're pulling to be, you know, line it up, get it started good when you're cutting with a handsaw. And hand planes the same way, the Jap Japanese and the Chinese, they would pull their hand planes toward you. Whereas we, in the Western society, we push them away from us. But pulling, you got more control. So they were a little smarter than us. <laughs> That's you know. interesting. So I'm going to start out just get, get a nice flat surface there. Okay, there's a flat edge. Now let's flip it. So, so in a world that rewards speed <laughs> and efficiency and and other things, reconcile that for us. I mean, you're doing this the way that people have been doing this for hundreds of years. Right. A guy will never get rich doing this. Um, you can't compete with the chairs they sell at RC Willys that are made in a factory. You just can't because, you know, a chair, one of these chairs takes me 40 to 50 hours. Um, so to make, you know, very good money, you're, but there's just something about the fact that uh, you're doing it by hand. I think a lot of, you know, you f I feel like a lot of my furniture, when I get done, there, a little part of me goes with it, whatever you want to call that. Right. Your spirit, your, uh, but just part of you goes with that. And the fact that you did the work by hand, rather than just punched a button on a machine and had it come out and cut all the parts. And I'm not against that. I've been able to use tools I've never used before. Uh, I've never used a spoke shave before. And I can say that that's probably one of my I've enjoyed using this the most of the new tools that I've learned to use. And it's been a lot of fun, you know, and and then the chair's actually turning out, so that's that's nice. So you can see what happens as we we get to that point. We're gonna shave it down to this point and just slowly refine. Once we get to about here, I'll bring in a spoke shave, which is exactly what it is, it was used for doing the spokes on wagon wheels. Again, it draws. Draws towards, towards you, yeah. so you would, you know, that one's pretty much about ready to fit in the chair. Final fitting, but this one isn't. So we could come in here and you. Yeah, that's more sliders. fine work, obviously. This is more fine work, right. yeah. And then I have some tools. Uh, 
that I've made just for sizing purposes. So that one tells me the different sizes. Right, so Five you're eighths. getting close, Yeah, right? so I know I'm getting close. This one should, usually this upper one is, depending on the chair, it's either 5 sixteenths or 3 eighths. That one's a 3 eighths. When it, um, and then the bottom is usually always like a half inch, which is the half inch there. So that little sizing tool helps me get them right to the size. And for the final fitting, I actually put them in the chair for the very last thing before I glue them in. Well, all of these chairs look like they could have come out of Ben Franklin's house or Thomas Jefferson's house. Yeah. They are all new. Um, they all have different names. People call them different things, but they're all... So this, this one right here is called a birdcage chair, which kind of, understandably, it's got lots of little, looks like a birdcage a little bit. That chair is a lot more difficult than it looks because the whole back is bent. When they're not straight, it's a little more difficult to get them coming up perfect. And so there's some tricks you have to do to do that. If I could do this as a living, I'd do it because I really like working with wood and it's a lot of fun. When you're doing something you've done over and over again, you know, at first you have to think about it. Pretty soon it just comes natural to you and you do something about doing, kind of whether you want to call it a menial task, you, you're able to think better. It does, it exercises your mind. There must be a chemical that takes off in your brain and, and you're able to get a lot of thinking done, you know? At The Long Way Home, we spent a lot of time on Vista's venues, people and places that do such unique things. Artists like Chad of the Windsor Chair Shop taught us that sometimes wood wants to be what it wants to be and allowing that to happen in an old fashioned way provides the mind a great opportunity to heal and to solve problems. The Long Way Home features a lot of great things where we can take those in. Thanks for joining us at The Long Way Home.